Welcome everybody on Zoom, welcome everybody in the lecture hall, welcome everybody from the future. Today we will uh, look at something new, completely new, different from what we've seen until now with uh, Boolean retrieval uh, or even wildcard queries and phrase queries and so on. It's a whole new way of uh, indexing um, documents and of processing queries. Before we start, uh, I just wanted to say a few final words that I don't think I had a chance to, to say it last time on index compression. Um, I told you what entropy is about, right? It's, uh, it tells you the minimum number of average bits that are necessary uh, to encode information. And so when you, when you want uh, to encode information, you convert the numbers to uh, bits, possibly dynamic, dynamic number of, uh, of bits. And we saw that whether it's optimal or not depends on the distribution of the information you want to encode, right? So in our case, the distribution of the gaps uh, that we have. Um, and if an encoding has the property that it is optimal within a constant factor, but that it is optimal for any probability distribution, that's called the universal encoding. An example of encoding that is not universal is the temperature encoding, the unary encoding, because this one is only optimal for the case that the probabilistic distribution is geometric, right? Negative powers of two. But it's only optimal for that. As soon as you take something else, it's no longer optimal. Um, the gamma encoding, however, is a universal encoding. This is quite a remarkable feature of it. And in fact, what that means, I, I said a constant factor, that factor is actually three. It is within a factor of three of being optimal, meaning that the average length, the average number of bits, is at most three times the entropy of the, of the random variable corresponding to the gaps, factor of three, whatever the distribution is, no matter what the distribution is. So this is remarkable. Why three? Well, three is actually conservative because technically we already saw that the factor is almost two. Uh, we saw that it takes twice as many bits as the, uh, as the base two representation, right? Why do we need twice as many? Because we need, to, we need it to be a prefix prefix code. But a factor of three is a constant, and so that qualifies as a universal encoding. And again, for absolutely any distribution, any random variable x, that's going to be true. So how are we doing? Quite well, actually, because now if we look at the uh, progress uh, that we make on compressing the postings list, originally we had 400 megabytes in the example that, uh, that we took. So uncompressed on 32 bits, everything on 32 bits. If you bring it down to 20 bits, then you will get down to 250 with the variable byte encodings of the uh, encoding of the gaps, right? So the, you, you only encode the gaps, then it's down to 116, but the gamma encoding actually make, makes it much better. Well, even better, maybe not much, but even better with 101 megabytes, yes? Uh, Oh, the delta encoding, that would be a good question. I don't think that they, that they, uh, saw, that they, um, that they tested this one. Yeah. So there is indeed many other encodings, including the delta encoding that you see in the exercises. Um, I am not sure if they tested it. It would be a good experiment though, to, uh, to do this. All right, so I don't know the answer, but, uh, but it would be a good thing to try. Okay. Uh, and that was for a collection of 960 megabytes uh, here. Yeah, all right. So that means concretely that we can squeeze more collection, bigger collections, more documents into less hardware, and we can save on the hardware costs for the indices. Plus, if you manage to squeeze this into a single machine, you don't even have to deal with the network uh, uh, issues and, uh, and all the latency over the network, right? So that helps you potentially squeeze it over a single machine, in a single machine. Okay, so now quick summary of what we've seen so far. So the Boolean queries assume that documents, uh, collections are sets of documents, documents are sets of words, and we have a Boolean query that selects a subset without any particular ordering, just a subset of the collection as the result. Then we saw that uh, I, that's something I mentioned until now, that if you use Google, you have uh, rankings. You have the top 10 documents uh, with this page rank algorithm. 
And so what we'd like to have is a ranked subset of documents, right? Maybe the top 10, and then you can paginate and get to the next 10 if you, if you want. So how do we do this uh, with a query that would be closer to, uh, to what you would type in a, in a search engine, right? Um, so let's see how we can tweak our system in order to handle scores. And one easy way or uh, easier way before we get to the vector space model is the idea of param parametric search. So the abstraction that uh, we have, I insist, until now is that the document is a set of words, meaning that if we express these as vectors, we will have booleans in the vector, right? Either a word belongs to a document or it does not. It's a one or it's a zero, right? So this is called the linearization when you create some artificial ordering of the words because you need to have the zeros and the one in, in some order uh, in your vector, right? So this is called a linearization. And then you, you, you have these zeros and these ones. Okay, now let's zoom back, let's zoom out. In a library, if you, if you go to the system or even on an online shop, you will notice that it's not just the content of the book, there's also metadata on the book. There's the title, there's the author, there's summaries, there's tags, there's dates, shipping dates, publication dates, language, and so on and so on. So we could also index that metadata actually, right? And typically offer an interface, a user interface that allows you to specifically look for title, author, publication date, and so on. In fact, many libraries, including the ETH library, let's, uh, let you search books in this way, right? But in fact, that's just a database problem because then you could just put everything like this in a relational table, and then that's just a SQL query. And this you already know how to do, right, from the uh, data management lecture. And in particular, you know from uh, relational databases that there are two main kind of indices and ways of making that fast. Um, it's the hash table and it's the P plus three. And surprise, surprise, it's exactly the same ones we've ha we have also used in the, uh, in the Boolean queries. So we could use uh, hash indices and B trees and B plus trees in order to index also this metadata, not the content of the book, but the actual metadata. Right. Um, so what you get, you do it for every fit, right? You know, in a relational database, you can build an index on any column or even set of columns. So we can have an index for the title, another one for the author, another one for the application date, the language, the country, the cost, and so on. So I put hash indices almost everywhere, just not for the publication date and the cost, why? Just because if you have a B plus three, you can have an order. And so for the publication date, you can have range, uh, ranges like this uh, of dates and the same for the cost. Uh, but for language, country, title, author, that doesn't make sense to have ranges. So for this example, I put a hash index, right? And then what you can do is look up based on what uh, people enter in this formula. You can just look up in the in the posting list because then you can again associate these indices with posting lists. The only thing that changes is that we don't have terms on the left. Instead, we have uh, other criteria, right? And then you intersect the results. For whom is that clear? Okay. So the new big picture now, if we have a more complete system, is that we have this so-called parametric indices that is on the metadata, title, author, publication date, and so on, plus the full text index, which is the, the, the standard inverted index we've seen a few weeks ago that maps the terms to the document, right? So now that would be our new big picture. We just have more indices. So how do we uh, then come up with scores? Because until now we don't have any scores. We have no way of ranking the documents. So how do we do this? We well, imagine that I do a search on title and author. Um, we could also extend title and author to be full text, right? So instead of uh, indexing them as a regular database, relational database um, uh, strings like exact matches, we could also treat the title and the author as if it were the content of the book, meaning we can just build a standard inverted index for them as well with full text search, right? So that means that uh, in the new version, we would move over instead of just having a single standard inverted index with the content of the book and the rest is just classical database indices, we move over the title and the author together with the body to three standard inverted indices, All right? Now we can also optimize a little bit 
and try to merge them into some kind of shared inverted index that has both the title and the abstract and the body. I, I took, oh, I, I put the author in there, could also be the abstract, but let's do with the author. So if we have a shared inverted index like this, this is the standard one. That's just the terms, the documents, that's the one you know. But if you want to extend it, we can just make this a little bit bigger and then we can add to the term. It's more like a pair, you have the term plus where it is. For example, we have a posting this on the top that corresponds to ETH appearing in the actual content of the book, the body, uh, and, uh, and uh, extend it in that way. And that way we can merge all of this. Now we have duplicate terms, right? We have ETH in the body of the book, ETH in the title of the book, and so on and so on, right? So here, uh, computer appears in the title of books one, three, five, and eight, uh, and computers appears in the contents of the books one, two, four, five, and seven, right? For whom is that here? Very good. Another way to do that, so we can either do it in the on the on the dictionary part on the left, or we can do it in the postings themselves, meaning that we keep the terms on the left, but then in the postings we we put the document IDs together with whether it's in the title, the body, or the abstract, for example. It can be anything else than title, body, abstract, it's just an example. All right, so there's these two ways of uh, of organizing things. But now Turns out we can actually derive a scoring system from this, now that we have not just the content of the book, but actually several places. The intuition is simple. If we have a term that is in the title of the book and in the content of the book, and I'm not going to say in the author because that doesn't make sense, but in the abstract of the book, then the chances are much higher that this book will be relevant to you. Because if the word is maybe in the content of the book, but not in the title, maybe it's a bit less relevant. So this is the intuition here. So I'm going to throw a formula at you that's actually just a scalar product, if you're familiar with linear algebra, which I assume you are. Uh, and we can compute the score of a document as the sum of GS, and I'm going to tell you what this is, obviously. So GI uh, is the weight of each zone. It's how important that zone is to you. Do you prefer the title? Do you prefer the abstract? Do you prefer the body? So maybe the title has a higher weight uh, and the abstract as well, and the body a little bit less, right? If you want to prioritize them. But these are just weights, these are just numbers. And uh, we sum over the zones. So in that case, L equals three in our example, right? Title, body, abstract. And we sum over all of these zones, right? So we have the zone of the weight, and this is just a Boolean. It's just a one if, uh, if the, the zone contains that term, if the title, body, or abstract contains that term. And it's zero if the, if the zone doesn't contain it, right? So this is just a product, and we sum this over the title abstract body. Okay, so this is just, in fact, a scalar product, right, a, a dot product. Okay, but let's do it with a concrete example. Imagine that I assign these weights uh, to, uh, to, to my zone. It's completely arbitrary, right? 0.3 to the title, 0.2 to the abstract, and 0.5 to the body. And now, information appears in the body of document one. So if we do that sum, that's just going to give us 0 0.5 times one and the rest is times zero, so it doesn't appear, right? So it's just a total of 0 0.5 for document one, for the term information. Now let's look at the second one, title and body for document four. So here we have 0 0.3 times one, we have 0 0.2 times zero, so we ignore it, and 0 0.5 times one, right? So we sum 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 and get 0 0.8, right? So that's the idea, and now we have a score of 0 0.8. And finally, document five for the term information has a score that involves only the abstract and the body because it's not in the title. So we have 0.3 times zero doesn't appear, 0.2 times one and 0.5 times one, they appear. And then we sum in 0 0.7. For whom is that here? So in fact, this scary formula, well, I'll have scarier formulas than that, right? But basically this scary formula is just the sum of the weights over the zones that the term appears in, right? It's a simpler way of putting it. Okay, so now we have done it for all our documents and we just rank them like this. We sort by score decreasing. And now we see that document four has the priority then document five, then document one. This is progress because we didn't have this before. Before we only output a subset, but there was no particular ordering. Now we are capable of ordering the results and finding the top scores. 
And this gives us something that looks more like a search engine as you could find in the internet, right? For the web, but even the EDH library also has uh, that kind of a search engine which uh, sorts the documents. So we have a primitive but existing scoring system that we built out of this that I think should be clear to you. How do we do it with two terms? Because that was only one term. But if the query has two terms, so in the Boolean case, that was easy. It's just the intersection of the posting list. But now we have more work to do. We also need to compute the scores for information and retrieval. So what do we do? Uh, we just do what we've been doing for information. We do the same with retrieval. And now for document four, information appears in the title and the, and the body. So that's three, point three and point five. Retrieval appears in the title and abstract of document four. So now we have 0.3 for the title and 0.2 for the abstract. 0.5 is times zero, so it's not there. And then we can, for example, it's just a way of doing that, right? We could naively sum that all up and get a score, right? It's only the most easy, the easiest way of doing that. You can imagine plenty of variations and optimizations and tweak it. And, you know, you can arrange it in plenty of different ways. For example, instead of the sum, you could take the average over the terms and so on and so on, right? Depends on your needs. All right. So as I said, this is more complex than just intersecting because in the case of the Boolean system, we just intersect, that's easy. But if you remember how the intersection was done, we traverse in parallel the postings list. Why? Because they are sorted according to document ID. So we just traverse them in parallel and we are able to compute the intersection in linear time. Can we extend this system in order to compute the score? And the answer is yes. We can also try to use a similar pattern of traversing all of these document IDs, these posting this in parallel. And uh, what we do is that instead of just building the intersection, we also add these scores document by document as we move along in increasing document IDs, every document we compute this thing and store it in that list right there. Then we can sort. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so we can extend the algorithm in a, in, a, in a straightforward way to still have this scanning pattern from left to right concurrently on all this. This is very important because we'll keep doing that also with the vector space model. We'll have a similar thing. Okay, now where do the weights come from? If you have a simple system, you can just put your own weights, right? But maybe you also want to adapt the weights to the real world. And typically what you can do is just base yourself on some sample or data sets that basically contains uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, queries and results. And for a specific query and a result, either the result is relevant or it is not relevant to the query. How do you know a human being tells you, right? And I already explained to you that the relevance is not about whether the result is correct technically compared to the query, because this is just math. It is, of course, correct because the algorithm is correct. But relevance means relevance given the intent of the human being, because the human being might have typed a query, but they are not familiar with the system or so on, and maybe the query doesn't give them what they want. So the relevance is about the human being. And so every time we collect a data set like this with these uh, vectors, so these are the Boolean vectors uh, uh, corresponding to the document that we look at, right? It doesn't matter what the query is, it was some query, uh, and that query gives you, gave you these results for a specific document, and this is what the human being that you asked told you. Uh, yes, it was relevant to me, or no, it was re not relevant to me. You can do this a million times or a billion times with plenty of different queries and plenty of different documents, and all you keep are these vectors uh, for the for the zones and whether it's relevant or not. And then you you can basically try to find the optimal weights that over the entire data set gives you a scalar product, give you a scalar product that is as close as possible to the RJs, right? So of course the RJs, they are zeros and ones, right? And the, on the left, it's not going to be zeros and ones, so it's not going to be equal, but you want to maximize the error, more exactly the, the, the square, uh, of the difference, right? Uh, and of course, to many of you who know machine learning, this probably tasted like machine learning. For whom did that taste like machine learning? Right, that was machine learning, in fact. And this is where I refer you to other lectures, including the uh, by uh, Andreas Krauser, also uh, Joachim Buman for the advanced machine learning next year. So this is where you can have fun 
uh, actually learn in the waves, right? And I'm stopping here this part because that's not a machine learning lecture, but this is where it connects to, uh, to machine learning, at least one of the many ways that information retrieval connects to machine learning. Okay, it turns out that sometimes you can only approximate things and you have things that are called, for example, uh, stochastic gradient descents that are wonderful inventions that just optimize by the, the more time you give to the system, the more it's going to converge to something better and you optimize, uh, you minimize the loss, for example. Uh, it turns out that in some cases that are simple enough, you even have exact solutions. You don't even need to, to learn, you just directly compute the weights out of your system. But Sadly, it's uh, rather rare. I mean, if we could do this for chat GPT, then probably we would know it, right? So that's just a scientific curiosity that sometimes we have the exact numbers. Okay. Um, now, um, I'm going to move on to something better than this. That was only a naive thing, what we did with these uh, zones and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, parameters. It's just to give you a first impression of what a scoring system could look like. But let's do something better. In order to do something better, though, I'm going to change the level of abstraction that we have on our collection. Because for many weeks now, or probably seven weeks, we have abstracted things by looking at documents as sets of words. Either a term is in a document or it's not in a document. Let's try to have less abstraction or to, to tweak our abstraction to also care about the number of times a term appears in a document. So instead of looking at documents as sets of words, I'm gonna look now for today as bags of words. Bag of word means that I care about the number of occurrences, but I still don't care about the order in which they occur. That I don't care, but I still care about the number of times it will be in a book. All right. And if we have the bag of words model instead of the set of words models, there are things that we can start doing that we could not do before, or maybe that made less sense to do before. I'm going to start first with the notion of um, term frequency. The term frequency, TF, it's often abbreviated as TF, is the number of times that the number of times that a term appears in a document. This is why, if you if you look carefully, there's two things in the subscript of the TF. Very important. Here you have the TF here, T e and D. It depends on the term and it depends on the document. This is very important. It's two dimensional, right? So here I take a specific document, right? So this is why it's only one dimensional here, but that's only because I fix D, but technically it's two dimensional. So here's a document, D. It's a bag of words, so you can have repeating words now. It's not just a set, it's a bag. And now I can derive my TF of T and D. It's easy. How many times do you see foo on the left? One, two, three. How many times do you see bar one, the second line and one and the last line? So two. How many times do you see foo bar? Two. So TF, of foo d is three, tf of bar d is two, and tf of foo bar d is two. For whom is that clear? Okay, so this is the term frequency uh, definition. So can we use term frequencies in order to derive a scoring system then, now that we have the bag of word semantic? And the answer is yes, we can try something. Let's try something. So we could have a query that is foobar foobar, just uh, picking random words, foobar foobar. And I'm looking at two documents for which I know the term frequencies, document A and document B. So I see here that term foo appears five times in document A and only once in document B. Bar does not appear at all in document A, so zero, and it appears four times in document B and foobar appears twice in document A and not at all in document B. Notes that now this is two dimensional, right? I have my documents on the on the um, columns and my terms on the row. So now this is this is a matrix, right? It's two dimensional. So this is TF of a foo uh, of foo a is five and so on and so on. Okay. So can I compute score? Yes, I could naively just sum over the term frequencies for all terms. I sum over the terms for all document in term. So for document A, if I compute that sum, it's the sum over the column, five plus zero plus two, I get seven. And for B, it's one plus four plus one, and I get six. 
All right? So I just sum over each column and I get scores. So according to this naive first try, I would deduct that I return as a first result document A. Does that make sense? Because you could make an argument here against that, right? If you look again to the to what we have here, terms B does not appear at all in A, but it terms bar, sorry, does not appear at all in document A, but it appears in document B. So it seems that this, this word bar seems to be kind of more distinguishing between A and B, because you're probably more interested in document B than document A, given that, right? Even though the score computed in that way would be lower. Who agrees that document B would probably make more sense given this term frequency matrix? You don't all agree? The, the intuition is that if you have um, words that are very common, maybe who and who bar here, we are just talking about words like V, A, is, where, and so on. And maybe bar is actually a word like computer, right? That is actually specific. So would you agree that we should give less weight to the words that are everywhere and more weight to the words that are rarer because they are more distinguishing in the quality of a document? Yes, that's exactly the intuition. So the first try here, where we just blindly sum over the terms for the term frequencies, uh, that doesn't exactly giving us what we would like to have, right? So we need to improve a little bit. So since the intuition that I gave you is how rare a word is, we could try to quantify how rare a word is. So one way of doing that is to just count over the entire collection how many times we find that word. That's called the collection frequency. So here I have a collection of three documents and I put each document as a bag of words with the words inside. And now I can compute the collection frequency of all of these words. So there's only three words if you look closer. There's foo, there's bar, and there's foo bar. So what's the collection frequency of foo? Well, there's a four here, but let's check foo. One, two, three, and four. So we have a collection frequency of four in total. Then bar, collection frequency, one, two, three, four. Oh, I think I probably made a mistake here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Probably should have put a six there. Okay, I'll fix it. So it should be a six, I just count. And then foo bar, one, two, three, four, five, right? So I have a five in there. So the collection frequency only has one parameter. It's the term. And for every term, you count the total number of times it appears in the entire collection, right? Is that nice? Well, here, that would basically tell us that uh, U bar and bar are comparable. Even with my mistake that bar is six, five and six is still uh, very close to each other. So in that case, are U bar and bar similar? Probably not. Why? Because Look closer, bar appears in every document. It appears in document one, it appears in document two, it appears in document three. So it could be something like V, were, is, and so on. So a very common word. Fubar, uh, fubar however, only appears in document two. So that's probably a more specialized word, like computer or mathematics or something like that. So it seems that fubar should have quantitatively a number that makes it rare, but bar shouldn't have a number that makes it that makes it rare, right? And yet they are quantified in the same way. So what that means is that the collection frequency, that's still not what we need, right? It's not exactly what we need. So we need something different. And the actual uh, thing that we use is the document frequency. The document frequency, it's still defined on each term, but instead of counting the total number of occurrences of the world, it only counts the number of documents that contain the world. So if you look now again, who appears in two documents, the first and the second one, so it has a document frequency of two. The term bar appears in all three documents, so it has a, the maximum document frequency, n, the number of documents, three. And foo bar appears in only one document, so it has a document frequency of one. So now we have something that seems to work because now the rare terms, they will have a very low document frequency. And if a term has a very low document frequency, 
this is the terms you want to look at when you do your scoring system. This is the term that you would want to give more weights to. The term bar, why would you even bother about it? It's everywhere, right? So this is more like a stop word kind of, uh, kind of term. So intuitively, the stop words have very high document frequency and the rare words, they have low document frequency. Who is following that? Okay, so now be careful. We have term frequencies, two quantities in the subscript, two things, the term and the document. We have the collection frequency that we won't really use, but it's still there, defined on a term, only one dimension, only one uh, letter in the subscript, T. And the document frequency, also only one dimension, only one, that's the term, and that's it. So you need to know them. If I give you a collection of documents and I ask you, okay, what's the term frequency of this term and that document, you should be able to answer. If I ask you what the collection frequency of this term or what's the document frequency of this term, you should be able to answer. Who would be able to do that? Okay, very good. Now, if I want to score, I want a rare terms to give me a high score. So I need to cook something with the math here in order to make a low number here, give me a high score. So I need to tweak that a little bit. So what we do in order to make that tweak is we take the inverse of the document frequency rather than the document frequency. Uh, and more exactly, it's not exactly one over, it's basically N over. We divide the total number of documents by the document frequency. Um, so we do that and then we take the log. So let's do it together. So bar is the easy one. The log of three over three is zero. That's what happens with stop words, right? If the, if the document frequency matches the total number of documents, then it's uh, N over N, that's a one and the log of one is zero. That's the lowest possible IDF. It means inverted document frequency that you can have. Now, two, that would be log of three over two. So it's 0 0.41, it's a bit higher. And now FUBAR, that is very rare, that as rare as it gets, well, rarer would be zero, but then it wouldn't even be there because it's not in the collection. So this is the log of three over one. And that gives us a 1.10. Now that looks more like something we can use in a scoring system, right? Because FUBAR would contribute a higher weight to the score, bar no weight at all, it's zero, it's a stop word, and FU uh, in between. For whom is that intuitive? All right, so this is called an IDF, inverted document frequency, yes? Uh, I think it's probably experiment experimentally figured out that it makes more sense. So just repeating because we didn't have the microphone. Uh, you're asking wh why the log? Basically, what's the justification for the log? I think the main idea is to smooth, uh, smooth things a little bit. Um, the idea is that um, if you look in absolute terms, the difference between a hundred thousand and a million uh, is a lot if you look in absolute terms. It's much more than the difference between one and a hundred thousand. But if you look in terms of search interest, logarithmically, the difference between one and a hundred thousand is much more than the difference between a hundred thousand and a million because you have a factor of 10 to the power of five versus 10. So the idea of the log is to take this into account to say if, if a word is, is, uh, is, um, is very common or double as common, you don't care. But if a word is 10,000 times more rare, then you care about the difference. So this is why the log, this is an intuition of that, right? And in practice, this is how it, uh, how it came into use, okay? All right. Um, and it might also be, I mean, the, I think that's the stronger reason. The other reason is to avoid an explosion also in the, in the numbers, because if you have very, very large collections, then uh, that could be, become also maybe not manageable and uh, then you get into some, some issues. Um, all right. So that's the IDF. A lot of people just say IDF. They don't even say inverted document frequency. So if you hear IDF, you should know that this is what it is about. Right, and very, it's very common to use the IDF as the weight. Now, DF, we've actually already been seeing this for weeks already 
In fact, already from week two, we've seen DFs, the document frequencies. Where did we see them? Yes? Yes, that's the purple number in the standard inverted index. So you see the document frequency is not new to you. It's just the purple number. It's the number of postings that you see associated with the term in the standard inverted index. Right, it's exactly the same thing. All right. Okay, so now we have the term frequencies that we have because of bag of words. We also have the IDF, the inverted document frequency, that's log of n over the purple number. Uh, how do we build a score where we can try to multiply these things, right? So we multiply the term frequencies with the IDF of the term. So we get a factor of five. So five one becomes 25, five. Bar was zero four. Now we have a factor of 10. I just made that up, right? Um, so we have a factor of 10, so 0, 40, and 2 and 1 as the term frequencies of FUBAR, and we have FUBAR that has a factor of 3. What do we learn here? FUBAR is very common, BAR is very rare, and FU less rare. Okay? So then we sum over, and now that you know we, I, I overweighted BAR with the IDF, that is rare, and it makes sense because it's not even in document A. And now I have a higher score for document B. So now this is closer to the sort of things that we want to have from the system. Make sense? This is called the TFIDF. And you can really learn these five letters, TFIDF. This is what it's called. It's the TFIDF scheme, term frequency inverted document frequency. So you'll very frequently hear, not just from me, but in the literature or in books, that you compute the TFIDF weights. And this is what it means. So it's super, super popular. We'll see that there are variations of that, but TFIDF is really the, uh, the plain standard way of doing it. Okay, so now I think you would be capable of even writing a program if I give you a, a, a set of documents uh, and I take the, the, the tokenization and lemmatization for granted. So I, I, I explained to you that it's very difficult, but if you are able to do that and you have your documents as bags of terms, now you should be capable of computing the TFs IDFs. Who would be capable of that? Okay, awesome, so that's it. And uh, you'll have exercises in order to do these sort of things. All right, now that was just math involving addition and multiplication. Can we formalize things a little bit? And the answer is yes, we can now try to get a bit more formal about things. Um, who took a linear algebra lecture? All of you, right? Mandatory. Who loved it? Some of you. Who liked it? Who hated it? Who thinks it's useless? Okay. By now, if you did machine learning, you know it's not useless, right? Because it's all over machine learning. But turns out it's also all over information retrieval. So we have a model that's called the vector space model that is completely different from the Boolean model. So again, in the Boolean model, we had sets of words, but now we have bags of words. So I already told you that, but what I didn't tell you is what it means in terms of the, the vectors, because for the set of words, we had vectors of Booleans, but now we have vectors of numbers. And in fact, these numbers, here I put decimal numbers, right? But you could put the term frequencies in there, technically. You can build your documents with term frequencies. Right? A document is just a vector that contains the number of times that every term appears. Right? Then you would have a, a integers. And now that basically means that you can interpret this TF, the, the term frequency as a matrix. Right? It's a two-dimensional matrix with the, the terms and the documents. So a single document is a vector of numbers. Why did I not put integers here? Because we'll see that we can actually go ahead and use the TFIDFs. So what I put in there are basically TFIDFs. So this is why they are decimal because of the, of the, the IDF technique. All right, so we can represent a document as vectors of numbers. It's just the vector of the TFIDFs, which would be the standard way of doing that. All right, so again, in the Boolean querying, we would have documents as vectors, and now we can interpret the documents of vectors, if there were actually only zeros and ones, as the edges, as the vertices, sorry, as the vertices of the hypercube, right? For whom does that make sense? You can interpret if you only have zeros and ones here, that's basically the vertices of a hypercube. For example, let's do it with a square, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. That would be if there's two terms. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that would be a, a, a hypercube in the dimension seven, 
which I think none of us can imagine in our minds because we are only used to dimension three. But technically, these are this is a point uh, on the vertex of a seven-dimensional hypercube. All right. Okay. Now, what if I don't have just zeros and ones, but now I have real numbers? Well, let's still assume they are positive. So we have positive real numbers in there because we have a bag of our models. These, these are my TF-IDFs, right, for, for the document that I'm looking at. Um, if I don't like TF-IDFs, I can also just use plain old term frequencies without IDF. As we saw, it might not be a good idea, but you can still do that. Uh, and you can also use plenty of other weighting schemes that we we'll look at later, right? But for now, I'm assuming TF-IDFs. So now, oh, I, I clicked and now you saw that. So probably the answer would be very easy, but how do you, how do you visualize this? So what, what is the set of all these vectors that I, that I can get? It's basically the first quadrants of the, the, the R to the power of M, where M is the number of terms, right? If I have two terms, it's the plane. If I have three terms, it's uh, three-dimensional space. But if I have 500,000 terms, then it's just a vector space of dimension 500,000, right? First quadrant means that the coordinates are positive. There is nothing down there. There is nothing on the left. It's all positive, just because I have positive numbers here. For whom is that intuitive? Right. So you see? With the Booleans, I was only on the vertices of my hypercube because it's only zero and one, but now that I have real numbers, positive can be anywhere there. So it means that now you've told me you're able to compute the TF-IDFs, you're able to compute the vectors. So technically, once you have done that, you could plot these documents on, uh, on a graph like that. So, okay, you can do this if it's two terms because it's two dimensional, then I know, of course, if it's a million terms, this is not humanly doable, but never, nevertheless, for the purpose of the lecture, I'm going to abstract things with dimension two, but you have to just keep in mind that this is actually more like dimension one million. Uh, all right, so now every document, which is a vector of real numbers, is a point, a point in the first quadrants of a vector space of dimension M. So you can either look, this is something you know from linear algebra, you can either look at them as points or you can look at them as vectors coming from the origin, which can also be useful uh, as we will see. Okay, so this is why it's very common to switch to a vector notation uh, where you can use this, uh, either this row on top of it or in some papers, you will just put it in bold and then it means it's a vector, right? So now we have this vector. So there is a first thing that we can do now that we have uh, a vector space, we can do fancy things with these vector spaces. Um, we can in particular compute the norm of the vector. So there's plenty of kinds of norms, but one of them is the Euclidean norm, right? It's just the square root of the sum of the squares. You heard about this one, right? You know about this one, it's one of the, of the famous ones. Uh, you, you probably even know it from high school or before because of the of uh, Pythagoras, right? Anyway, uh, that's the Euclidean norm. Of course, this is a, this is not just a vector space. Then it's a vector space that also has actually an inner product or a dot product because this is in fact the the the, the inner product of x with itself, and then we take the square root, right? So it's not just a vector space; it's a vector space that has additional features that allow us to do these sort of things. But since we since we are in a vector space that is r to the power of m, then we have these features. Okay, so that's the Euclidean norm. Now that I have the Euclidean norm, I can do something that's called renormalization. So how can I renormalize that document? That's a document; it's a vector. How can I renormalize it? You see that I just divide by the norm, right? So it just means that I bring it back to the to the unit sphere, right? I bring it back to something that has a length of one, that has a that has a length of one. Um, the intuition here of why we are doing that is that if I have document one and document one renormalized, which is technically a different document because it has different numbers, but it's a renormalized version of that, it doesn't make such a big difference. Does anybody have the intuition of why, if I renormalize a vector like this, the documents, it doesn't really change the document for the search purposes? Can anybody tell me why? Maybe on Zoom? 
you have anybody on Zoom? Let me ask the question differently then. Imagine that I take a book and I compute the vector, so the TFIDFs and the vector, and I put it somewhere as a point here. Now, let me theoretically consider the concatenation of the two books. I'm just taking the same book and I'm printing it over again and I have a book double the size, but it's just a repetition of the first book. Where would be my point in that vector space, even the first one? If it's X, the, the original document, what is the formula for my document where I just write the book twice? Yes? Two times, exactly, two X. You just multiply with two. So intuitively here, it's almost a factor two. So technically, the uh, renormalized D1, if you, take, if, if you took this as a book and you uh, doubled it, so you rewrite it again, then you would go there. In terms of search purposes, does it make a difference? Not really. It's the same to you. If you have doubled the book or, or you know, it's, it's the same thing. So this is why if you are in the same direction from the origin and you only have a difference by a content factor, then this is basically for all practical purposes, the same documents. So this is why we like to renormalize things and bring everything back to the unit length in order to process it. So now you deserve the break. Uh, and after the break, we are going to continue our adventure of interpreting information retrieval in a linear space, in a, in a vector space. So I see you in uh, 15 minutes. I think it's one past, so 16 past uh, uh, 11. Thank you very much. <laughs>